I'll start off. Um, I'm Bob Bauman, President of Financial Security Bank. And you talked about tailoring the examinations for community banks. Um, but I think that it's going to be more important that we truly have the exemptions from Dodd-Frank rather than the, just the tailoring. Because if they can tailor to choose to not come down on us, uh, I feel that we need it to have it more fixed, that they won't come down. Because otherwise, on the other side, they could choose uh, to come down on us and really implement the Dodd-Frank um, uh, pieces. But if we have the exemption from it, I think that's more important. You know, I, that's, that's uh, certainly something that uh, I, I concur with. You know, and then uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, so the, the way supervision uh, works in the Federal Reserve System is a delegated function. So um, to, 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 what does that mean? That means the regulations get written uh, in Washington by the Board of Governors, and we're in charge of, of going out and enforcing them. Um, and then those regulations, of course, come from laws uh, written by Congress, your representatives in, in Congress. Uh, the, the, I think the strongest form of exemptions, obviously, are ones that come from, from statute. And uh, that's going to be the best protection against, uh, to, that's the best form of tailoring. The, hard, the, the hardest form of tailoring is, is what can come from Congress. So I, I certainly agree with that. Harry Forst, I'm president of Citizen State Bank, Norwood Young America. Uh, one of the thoughts I had similar to Bob's is that uh, the regulatory trickle down or the uh, uh, and I, I sense a broad migration of it is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where I think uh, what is the Federal Reserve's thoughts on, I think we're, we're not necessarily getting even trickled down, we're getting usurped into several things that that organization was never designed to address by Congress. Does, uh, as a primary regulator, do you have an opinion or can you comment on the fact that uh, sometimes people jump over the fence and pull some people in from the other side of what was intended? You know, I, I'll, I'll just say in general that I think uh, tailoring is, is uh, to, to the size and other, other aspects of an institution is, is a good practice. As all of you know, the Consumer Bureau um, is, is not, is not uh, run in any way by the Federal Reserve. It's a totally separate organization and it's, uh, it sets its policies and regulations uh, accordingly. Um, but, but I, you know, I think this principle of tailoring is one that all regulators should be thinking about and applying in, in an appropriate fashion. One thing I'll, I'll say on that front, um, and it, this is speaking very generally again, but it's something we, I think, found very useful in the Federal Reserve is one way to make tailoring work is through communication. You know, I, I, think, uh, I think the Basel III example that I cited is a very good example of how that can work. It's, it's, you, 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 it's not enough for you to just meet and talk among yourselves about, boy, you know, here are the problems we face. It's good for you to bring those, for, those problems forward to, to, your, uh, to your representatives, to your, to your um, and to, to regulators themselves. That way, we have a better chance of doing a better job of, of, of creating the tailoring that I think is most effective in, in, uh, in, in, in from our point of view, in creating super safety and soundness for, uh, at a, and, and, and consumer protection. At, at, at the cheapest possible cost of the taxpayer. Mariana, thank you very much for coming today. Pete Hadlin, First National Bank Monoman. My question is this, I'm gonna let you off the hook on banking questions, but the unemployment rate seems to be stubbornly high, but yet uh, productivity seems to be very high as well. So are we going to have a recovery, and it's been dragging on for some time, uh, because of technology and, and the implement of technology and manufacturing and many other industries, we will never see the unemployment rate back down to the level where it was previously. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And uh, I want to thank Peter for his previous service. Uh, he was on, served on the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Minneapolis' Board of Directors uh, under my predecessor, Gary Stern. And that kind of service is invaluable to us. Uh, it's really critical in terms of exactly as, uh, one, one role it serves is exactly the kind of communication that I, I, I mentioned earlier. To, to, to get to, to your, your question, um, you know, I actually think that uh, I, I was more concerned about the, 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 the aspects you talked about, I would say, three or four years ago. Um, unemployment has come down more slowly than I would like, absolutely. We were at 10 percent in, in, um, in uh, October 2009 when I became president. Uh, we're now down to 6.2%, still, you know, I would say unacceptably high, 
but we continue to make progress on that. We've fallen uh, very sharply relative to where we were over by over a percentage point relative to where we were uh, about a year ago. So the unemployment rate continues to come down. Um, we have seen less growth in the fraction of people who have a job than you would like. So some, some than, than I would like, I should say, speak for myself. Um, a, 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 a dis disappointingly large fraction of the decline in the unemployment rate I've talked about has come from people not deciding not to look for work. So the unemployment rate is, is uh, a measure of the fraction of people who have looked for work in the past four weeks relative to the sum of that group and people who actually have a job. So the way the unemployment rate can go down is two ways. One, people can get jobs or they can stop looking for jobs. And so what we've seen is the, the fraction of people who have, who, uh, the, a lot of the decline in the unemployment rate is coming from that, that second mechanism. And the, the way to see that is, that I just, as I mentioned, even among prime-aged uh, potential workers, 25 to 54, the fraction of those people who have a job remains, remains low. Is that due to, to, our, to the supply side, the production productivity of our economy? On, uh, there's not enough room for workers. Um, the, from a monetary policymaker's point of view, where the, the way you see the constraint is through inflation. As long inflation, as inflation remains low, below 2%, below our target, we have room to be, a, be supportive and to be helpful. Now, how much support can we provide? So, uh, so I suppose you, you, your, your outlook for inflation was it was going to be running at 1 and 3 quarters percent over the next, that sounds very close to 2, 1 and 3 quarters, 2, those numbers sound very close to each other. But our est we've done estimates at the Minneapolis Fed. If you were able to boost demand by enough to push inflation up by that, that small 25 basis points, you're going to be pushing the unemployment rate down by something closer to a full percentage point. And that's on the order of a million jobs. So that's where monetary policy, I think, has, still can have room to be, be of support and be assistance in this, in this process. I, you know, that, so that I, I, I think that we, the recovery we've seen uh, the decline in the unemployment rate. My own forecast for the longer run unemployment rate we can get to in the country is continuing to fall. And it's now, I would say, it, it, uh, my longer run uh, outlook for unemployment is at five and a quarter percent. Um, so that's, uh, you know, still got some room to run and much closer to where I, uh, to, to uh, uh, our 2007 levels than, than I would have thought th uh, three or four years ago. Thanks for being here. I'm Noah Wilcox with Grand Rapids State Bank, and I'd just like to say again, I appreciate your uh, support of exemptions, but I, my question is uh, relative to the tailored exam process. We were one of the first that experienced the off-site portion of work, and we've gone through that now a couple of times, and the question is, do you see coming down the line relative to that, the on-site portion of the exam process beginning to shorten? Because we have a longer first day letter. We provide lots more information up front to you. The off-site portion gets done, and then we still have the same number of regulators in my shop for two weeks. So, and that's fine. I mean, we're not <laughs> capable of self-regulating, uh, apparently. So, but my hope is that doing that off-site work and having uh, sort of the ongoing management dialogue that you do while you're doing the off-site portion would reduce the on-site number of regulators and the, and the duration that they're there for. Could you speak to that, please? Yeah, that's certainly my, my hope and my expectation. Um, you know, it's a relatively new framework, and there's, there, what, what happens at the beginning of a, a new, new program, a new framework, is not what you hope to see in steady state. Uh, certainly, my, my expectation and hope is, is similar to yours. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, ben Eskirka, United Bankers Bank. I'd like to thank you as well for being here today, I appreciated your comments. I'm not going to hammer you on regulatory issues, okay? I'll switch gears on you. Uh, early on in your tenure as president of the Federal Reserve Bank, you had come out in speeches and writings as being quite hawkish and had it called for immediate rate increases. Uh, something has transpired here subsequently, and I was wondering if you could speak to the how, what, and why that has led to the transformation to where you're perceived now as being one of the most dovish members of the FOMC, as opposed to one of the more hawkish? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, no, I mean, it's, uh, 
it, it's really fundamental to the way I approach policy and the way I think about my job is um, I was a uh, hawk because I was worried about inflationary pressures and those continue not to materialize. And, um, you know, as long as inflation remains low relative to target, we can be of assistance. What I was worried about is that I, I, I thought in 2011 inflation was running pretty high. My, my own forecast was that I was concerned about some of the constraints really that Peter mentioned that um, we might not be able to get back to, to the unemployment rate we'd seen in the past without having undue inflation. And the evidence just ran against me. You know, you, you start, <laughs> you know, you get beaten in the head with the numbers enough and you have to change your mind. And that's, that's what I've done. I'm Steve Gilmer from the State Bank of Delano. We talk about increasing employment, but all I've seen over the years is more and more and more production leaving this country and more and more shiploads of product coming in from China. And uh, it, it just bothers me that I can't buy a television set or a radio or anything made in the United States. And we used to be high producers. So where is the limit? And when do we become more the parent instead of the child of China? Well, I'm going to talk in more general terms about your question than perhaps you, you want me to do. I, you know, as, as countries evolve and grow over time, uh, the nature of the tasks they do, the pe their, that their people do, changes over time as well. If you go back 150 years um, in this country, um, a lot of us would have been on the farms. And it's been a good thing that we don't do that anymore. You know, the fraction of the workforce in the, in the agricultural sector is, I'm probably going to give you too high an estimate even if I say 3% now. So that evolution is, is, is a positive. And I think you see a similar kind of evolution in, in what American workers do as well, um, a shift away from manufacturing into, into uh, to, to, to services. Now, that transformation, if it's moving us into more human capital intensive provision of services, uh, that's, a, that's a positive. And so that gets back to really the key issue is really what are we doing in terms of providing our, our people, our, our young people in particular, with the right kind of education, the right kind of human capital to be, be competitive in, in, in the, the global economy. Um, I don't think we should think to ourselves that we want to go back to the, 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 the kind of act, economic activities we were doing in 1955. I, I just think that's, that's not the right way to think about the U.S. economy. We're, we're much better off as a country than we were in 1955. And the reason we're better off is because the mix of activities we're doing is tilted towards uh, things that use more education, more human capital. What worries me is not so much the pattern that you described about, about the production of goods. It's more that what worries me is the rate of human capital accumulation among our young people and um, that we've achieved as a country over the last um, 20 years is not as high as a lot of other countries, including our neighbor to the north. Uh, you don't have to go as, you know, as people often talk further afield. Um, and it's not as high as it was from the 1970, 1990. That's a concern, because then you're not going to be able to get that same rate of growth, that same, same rate of uh, increase in, in living standards that we've enjoyed in this country uh, um, for, you know, really since the beginning. And so that's what I think about as an, as an economist is trying to make our people as productive as they possibly can. And is our educational system, that really gets to the heart of the matter is really in the educational system. And is that really doing the job, that it, the best job it possibly can? And uh, if you compare us to other countries, I think there's room for improvement on that. And uh, I, would, I would add to that, that as Minnesotans, we often uh, compare ourselves to other states in the union. And you know, there was a certain amount of, um, um, you know, satisfaction in that comparison. Um, um, but the right comparison is really with the world. You know, how are the best countries in the world doing? Because that's who, who, are, who, are, who our children are going to compete with later. So. want to add my thanks uh, for joining us today. But I need to ask you a question that probably has a little more sensitivity to this group. You talked about the trends in number of charters and the modeling that you've done on that. Um, my question is, is the Fed interested in impacting 
those trends, either accelerating them or slowing them, and is there in fact an optimum perspective of the number of charters to serve the needs of in, in this country? I, I, th I think that's a, a challenging question to answer, Marshall, because as I indicated in my speech, to the extent that that trend is being driven by technological change, um, being by, by, by the scale of operation and banking changing over time, I, you know, I just think we have to say as a society, you know, certainly people in this room are going to be impacted by it in different ways, but as a society, we, you know, there, I, I think we have to be comfortable with that. I think what we have, my, our job as policymakers, as rule, as my, my boss is in Washington, as rule makers, what we have to guard against is um, ineffective supervision, um, unduly burdensome supervision leading to an acceleration or a change in that rate of pace of a consolidation. And that's where we try to aim our work and try to figure that out and uh, make our contributions. I think my own, you know, I, I would, if I, if you, uh, if you ask me about the, the, the rate of decline in the number of banks in Minnesota, I think some fraction of it is due to technology. And that, I think, is, a, is not, a, not a reason for concern at a social level. But some of it um, is, I think, as well, con uh, due to the, the the increase in, in, in the regulatory burden, on, especially on smaller institutions, an increase in regulatory burden that's n not necessarily leading to any increase in safety and soundness. And that is where I think tailoring is the answer. And that's what I've been trying to express in my speech. Bruce Pekachnik from Northview Bank. Uh, my question is with uh, things slowing in Europe and Japan becoming deflationary, what do you see as the risk or odds of eight years into this that we have another five or ten years of, of low rate, low inflation, and uh, you know, looking at the one percent German ten-year bond? Uh, that's not something I think we're excited about. Uh, I mean, the uh, situation in Europe is is disturbing. Um, they uh, have. They face a situation where you know inflation is running very low relative to their their target, um, well below one percent. Um, they they face risks of of really having inflation expectations drift downwards in a significant and substantial way. And I think some of that is probably not all of it. But some of it is being reflected in, in the bond prices you refer to. Um, you know, in terms of the American situation, uh, inflation is is. Uh, the, uh, I, you know, I, I think there's a risk of that, but it's 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 much more modest than than in, than in Europe or what they face in Japan, where they're actually trying to take very aggressive actions to raise inflation expectations uh, from their very low level where they've been in the, over the last two decades. Um, so there's a risk of that here. I think we should be looking at Europe and Japan and 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 profit as monetary policymakers from their example, which is, you know, you hear a lot of concerns that. Um, it's time for us to exit, time for us to start thinking about, le you know, uh, leaving the zero lower bound and raising rates. But, boy, it's a mistake to go too early. And you, you, uh, we should profit from the examples of other, other uh, countries on that. Dennis Martinson, Glenwood State Bank. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, my question has to do with uh, the uh, employment, unemployment, and the unemployable. And uh, you know the numbers that might you might see as percentages in in those categories. Uh, an example in our communities, we have manufacturers that I know have uh, job openings for 25 employees in one company, another 12, 15, and another. So there seem to be those jobs there. And um, but I think the other concern that I see is, you know, what is our percentage of unemployables, and how do we do we have in place a system that kind of almost encourages people to be unemployable because we have other programs that almost incentivize them to not look for work or not find another occupation? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, you know, I, th these forces are at work. There are certainly the social insurance programs, which I, I think are, are, are valuable, do provide some incentives along the lines you describe. Um, you know, I. I don't think that, that those, I think what you, the, the thing I look at and I try to talk about is there's, I think these two measures, the, the people who are age 25 to 54 who are in the prime of their working life, you just see a sharp 
fall in the fraction of those people who have a job beginning in December of 2007. <laughs> it's hard for to tell a story which is and based only in in the in the uh, um, in, in social insurance uh, support for that sharp fall and then the the relatively slow return. The other piece I'll talk about is um, the people who have part-time work already um, presumably are employable, they have a job, and they say they would like to find more hours to work and aren't able to do it. There's always going to be, in a healthy economy, um, or even an economy that's, that's short of full employment like our own, there will be manufacturers and jobs that, that will go empty for maybe for extended periods of time. There, this is a very rich and diverse economy that we're trying to summarize with one or two numbers. And there will be, uh, you know, if we sat around and talked about IT, I'm sure we'd all talk about, boy, it's hard to find really great people in IT. And you're, you're always going to have, have those kinds of, I talked talk to, to people in Western North Dakota, they're going to talk about labor shortages. There, there's enough diversity in the economy, you can always find that. You you're, try to look as policymakers dealing with the macro economy, you have to try to look at Aggregate, more aggregative measures, and um, I just see these aggregate measures pointing us to being still short of full employment. And the fundamental one for me is on the inflation measure. As long as inflation continues to track below two percent, and my outlook continues to contract below two percent, there's there's more room for us to be of assistance. Yeah, thank you very much for your questions. Very much appreciate it.